I'm Larry Riggs. Our presentation today is Designing Curriculum for Fostering Transformative Learning and Critical Thinking. I will be speaking for myself and also for my colleague, Dr. Sandra Hellyer Riggs, uh, who is ill today. Curriculum design is the constructive alignment of means and materials with ends. Constructive alignment is a concept developed by Biggs. More specifically, and I think more helpfully, design is establishing goals or objectives and then reasoning backward from objectives to conditions and practices. In academia, goals are articulated on a number of levels. From the institutional mission statement, through disciplines and programs, to the syllabi and pedagogies of particular courses. Realistically, it is left to professors teaching courses to give substance and meaning to value statements by choosing, to the degree that that is possible, which courses to teach and which materials and pedagogical methods to use. Transformative learning and critical thinking can result from curriculum design that empowers and challenges students as intellectual and moral agents. In curriculum design, the teacher should create a learning environment that provides support for the learning activities that will help the student reach the desired outcomes. Using curriculum design, which provides ample interaction with other students and with, with the instructor, students can be changed from being simply receptacles of knowledge to, being more, to more meaningful learning through considering diverse viewpoints and questioning their own beliefs. In the author's cases, the most important educational ideas or goals are transformative learning and critical thinking. What educational experiences are likely to serve these purposes? Which elements of our courses, elements that we can control, provide those experiences. One author participates in a core curriculum program at a small private comprehensive university. This program is called Global and Historical Studies and among its goals is to engage students in investigation of and reflection about cultures different from their own. I choose to teach in this program because it seems an especially favorable overall conceptual environment in which to implement my most important educational ideas. This choice is the first one in my design of courses in which I can align my objectives and methods with the material. I teach two courses in the program, Modernizing and Contemporary Europe and Revolutionary Europe and Colonial, Post-Colonial Nigeria. These courses are excellent venues in which to pursue what Schulman has called pedagogies of engagement. How the content is presented and the responses elicited in the process of presentation are keys to any pedagogy of engagement. As Prideaux emphasized, curriculum is a conversation with students. A basic consideration then is what is being said to students by the ways in which a course is organized and conducted. Since habits of mind are a major focus of the courses, I write explicitly about habits of mind in the syllabus prospectus and make them a major theme throughout our exploration of the course's content. I organize these classes physically so as to facilitate the exchange of ideas. Students sit in an arrangement that enables each to see all the others. This encourages careful speaking and listening, and it emphasizes taking responsibility for thought and speech. It also says that the students are speaking to each other, not just to me. At every class session, I distribute a reading discussion guide, which includes questions and topics for the students to contemplate as they do the reading assignment and or view the visual material for the next session. The aim here is to foster reflection on what is being read, and to facilitate discussion in the next class. In other words, to go beyond coverage to eliciting thoughtful responses. Also part of my design is asking students to reflect on and reason about virtually every fact or historical event or process that we cover. In both courses, I begin our consideration of modernizing Europe by writing the date 1456 on the board. That date represents the advent of mechanical printing. I asked the students to imagine what might be the effects of the shift from hand copying of manuscripts on parchment to mechanical printing of books on paper, of the advent of information as a widely disseminated, commercially valuable commodity. What social processes are associated with increased literacy, with the shift from Latin to the vernacular languages? I asked the students to consider that 1456 represents the beginning of what we call the information age and to think of commercially produced and distributed information in connection with the internet. The next date I invite the students to reflect upon is 1492. The most important use of 1492 is discussing it as a mostly missed opportunity for transformative learning and critical thinking on the part of Europeans. What was the effect on Europeans of encountering people unaccounted for in the Bible and culturally utterly different from themselves? 
How did Europeans react intellectually and morally to this shattering challenge? Here begins our consideration of the costs of failing to learn and to think critically. Here also begins a practice that has plagued European history and prevented the full fruition of many wonderful European ideas. That is, defining members of other societies and cultures, and even some members of European societies and subcultures, as somehow less than fully human. In my curricular conversation with students, then, the most important things I say are that they are valued participants, that discussion of controversial subjects in a free and respectful way is valued, and that they are both autonomous and accountable for their learning and thinking and for the consequences thereof. The course also communicates through its structure and methods that the student's thinking is important and that it is part of what they had thought of as history, which happened outside themselves. From here on, I'll be speaking on behalf of my uh, co-presenter, Sandy Hellyer Riggs. In this part of the paper, I will be focusing on the social psychology class that I teach for several reasons, one of which is that it represents the content that I truly enjoy teaching, in addition to the fact that the curriculum is perfect for designing a classroom that is engaging and interactive. Some of the content of the social psychology course tends to be controversial, and this leads to lively discussions and exchanges of ideas. Most of the classrooms to which I'm assigned have desks that can be moved to create a more intimate environment and facilitate small group discussion. Also, all the classrooms are mediated so that I can show PowerPoint slides of my educational objectives and how they fit into the content for each week, video clips of social psychological concepts that apply the concepts to real life situations, and other related material. Biggs cited five main steps in the constructive alignment process. These were one, defining the curriculum's objectives, two, selecting teaching learning activities that will encourage students to attain the objectives, three, engaging students in the learning activities through the teaching process, four, assessing students' learning outcomes using methods that allow them to demonstrate how well their learning outcomes match the goals of the course, and five, determining a final grade and giving feedback to help students improve their learning. In my syllabus, I state my educational objectives for the course. At the end of the semester, students should be able to, and so on. From those more global objectives, I create weekly educational objectives for each unit, taking into consideration the question posed by Prideau. What do we want students to do as a result of the learning that takes place in our classes? Since constructive alignment curriculum design should provide support for learning activities so that students will reach the desired outcomes, I design different learning activities and different learning activities for each class session that are in alignment with the content and educational objectives. One example of a learning activity was to encourage students to understand how common gestures can be interpreted differently depending on an individual's background. Before I demonstrated some of these common gestures for the students, I divided them into small groups. Their assignment was to watch the gestures as I demonstrated them, come to a consensus in their group as to what the gesture meant, and describe their results to the class, including the discussion that preceded the group consensus. Most students were certain that they knew the real meaning behind each gesture. However, during the discussion, they realized that others had different interpretations depending on their background. This exercise demonstrated the interactive component of Prido's diagram, taking into consideration the backgrounds of the students, the student feedback through group discussion, the content, teaching methods, and the opportunity to interact. Each week, students in my social psychology class were required to participate in an online discussion forum before coming to class. In the forum, students were presented with a problem or issue to be resolved using the content of the text for that particular week. After students posted their own comment to the forum, they were to respond to a peer's posting. One chapter in our social psychology text covered so-called pro-social behaviors and what motivates individuals to help others or not to help. Students were given a scenario about a natural disaster and asked whether they would help or not. And if so, how would they help? Money, physical presence, moral support, etc. According to the constructive alignment concept, this exercise aligned content and methods with the educational objectives of that particular class session. Students interacted online and again in class when we discussed their forum comments, the reasons behind their answers, and the cognitive processes they used to reach their conclusions. Each class provided students with an opportunity to interact with each other and the instructor. Through interactions, their peers and I provided students with immediate feedback on both the content and cognitive processes utilized. Continuing with Briggs's steps for constructive curriculum design, my social psychology curriculum provided students with both formative and summative assessment. 
Continual feedback to students during the discussions in class and the interactive online discussion forums provided students with formative assessment. The summative assessment designed for this course was to give four exams during the semester in which students were assessed both on content knowledge and their ability to synthesize, as Bloom has it, the information and relate it in their own words through the filter of their self-constructed learning. Another assessment instrument I used was to have students write a reflection paper at the end of the semester describing what they learned from the course, both in terms of cognitive learning and in terms of social interaction. Our paper has presented ideas about how to design the curriculum and the classroom to foster transformative learning and critical thinking in two different content areas. We are both committed to designing a learning process that features experiencing, conceptualizing, analyzing, and applying new information and new ways of pursuing understanding. Our different pedagogical practices appropriate to different kinds of courses can be informed by the principles of curriculum design and can pursue the goals of transformative learning and critical thinking. Thank you.